Okay. So I think uh, we talked a little bit about history. Uh, so in this lecture, we're, we're just going to talk you know, uh, briefly about sociolinguistics and what the trend has been towards sociolinguistics. I think a lot of what we're saying about mother tongue is also echoed in sociolinguistics. So this critical nature of mother tongue. And so what, what kind of direction it's heading. And then we can talk a little bit about our work on mother tongue. So, you know, you can just see how we're also conceiving of it. So. So I'm focusing mostly on Indian sociolinguistics here. Uh, people who you, uh, many of you may be familiar with, just a few scholars as a sample. So, you know, idea of mother tongue, of course, we've already said this, so no need to say it again, right? In that sense is central to all kinds of language policy, conceptions of language, and also this sociolinguistics in India has also addressed quite a bit this question of mother tongue, okay, from a critical perspective. And uh, we know that, as we just talked about in the last lecture, mother tongue is important for people, right? It's the nationalism, people have emotional attachments uh, to mother tongue. That's one aspect. And the other aspect, which we talked about yesterday, which many sociolinguists are mainly engaged in. So this his, so the emotional aspect of it is mainly has been a historical, historical question. And this, uh, the, the policy element is what mainly sociolinguists have engaged in, right? So this is uh, the difference between, I think, the sociolinguistics and history of language. But in, you know, in our course, we're trying to talk about all the different aspects. So basically in, you know, we know that people accept this idea of mother tongue, census accepts this idea of mother tongue, but most of the sociolinguists <laughs> don't really <laughs> accept it in that way, okay? So this idea has persisted despite it being contested by sociolinguists. So if you just take one sociolinguist, for example, like Lakshman Kubchandani, as some of you may have read his work. So he argued that one cannot confuse the denotational identification of a language, right, by a particular community with the actual linguistic practice in a highly plurilingual, he uses the term, he doesn't use the term multilingual, he uses plurilingual because multilingual is very, implies discrete languages, right? So Kupchandani is like in India, it's not multilingual, it's plurilingual. There's, there's, the boundaries are fluid. So he says the identification of a language, like we just talked about different languages, Telugu, Tamil, Urdu, all this kind of languages in the, this is, uh, Mainly, he doesn't use this word, but we're using it. It's an ideological endeavor when we name a language and we identify it with a community, right? And the actual linguistic practice is plurilingual. So he calls this nationalistic linguistic engineering. This is what his term is, that what you're doing through nationalism. Now, of course, nationalism, as we talked about, has you know benefits, has emotional, is an emotional issue. But when it comes into policy, it's almost like engineering, engineering in a bad way. <laughs> so you know, you're you're just trying to create something, right? Mold something that is not out of a, a plurilingual practice. So he said that. What, what's happened is that there is a, there is a, this mother tongue is an ideology, right? We have ideology of mother tongue that's linked to what we conceive of as our community, our region, okay? And then we have our performance, okay? That's what we do on the daily basis, 
which is we speak different languages. So this is what he calls a paradox, quote unquote, in the Indian sociolinguistic situation. It's a, he, said, he sees it as paradoxical in a sense that this is, uh, this is a little bit, we have heterogeneous performance, but our perception is homogeneous, right? We see ourselves as when we are, when we're asked about mother tongue or something, maybe many of you, when we asked you this question, you also said, of course, some of you had a few different answers, but many of you had one answer. We see ourselves as a homogeneous kind of identity, right? Perception. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that the distinct mother tongue identity or our identity is more of an alignment, right? What we're doing is we're aligning to an individual or group, right? With certain formal or cultural attributes rather than we are talking about ourselves in terms of our realities, our sociolinguistic realities. So he said, as a sociolinguist, you look at the realities, but people within that reality are aligning with a very formal or cultural attribute of language. So this is part of what we call language. I mean, what in you know, another tradition, this linguistic anthropology tradition, they're calling language ideology. Right, uh, which I think Kupchandani really talks about. He even uses the word ideology for mother tongue, like very openly and, and very you know, straightforward. And he's of course a very senior, I mean, he's passed away now even. So, but he was like a very senior sociolinguist and he's been writing this for like since the 1980s, the 70s. So he gives this example here. If you look at it, just take the example of Marathi. He just gives an example of Marathi uh, in Nagpur area. Okay. Now, so in Nagpur area, there's Marathi, which is considered Nagpuri Marathi, which is the in group. Then there's a supra dialectical Marathi, which is that, that uh, more regional Marathi of that area. And then there's the standard. Okay. And there's the other regions of Marathi, other regional varieties. So people kind of have some idea about all of them. Right. And they speak that for different reasons and they have different evaluations for it, but they speak it. Okay, then there's also Hindu, hin, Hindi. There's a special Nagpuri Hindi that's also spoken because Nagpur is a very mixed place. It's like a very central part. So that is also hind, Hindustani, I guess. Then there's a the standard Hindi and then there's the Urdu. Then there's some English. Then some phrases, Sanskrit, Arabic, also mixed in there, okay? So if we look at the actual situation here, we're seeing that there's many different varieties that if you just take a few people from Nagpur, they will understand, communicate with to some degree, right? And be involved in. So how can we reduce this variety to something called mother tongue, <laughs> you know? But that's the difference between the performance and the perception. You ask anybody on the street, okay, Nagpur, you're from Nagpur, you speak Marathi, okay, Marathi. <laughs> you know, this level of detail is not there. Okay, 
So we have mother tongue as an ideology. I think we all kind of understand that, right? So that's something that we've talked about. And that's what in Indian sociolinguistics also they've talked about for some time. So, and all of you, I think, have this understanding, you know. But there's, so we live in a plural environment, okay? And we have certain ideologies. Now, our environment may be multilingual, plurilingual, and everything, right? But it's also hierarchical. It's not like everybody freely speaks like these languages and everyone just, we can understand them. And it's that, I mean, that's not the case here, right? <laughs> that's not the case, you know? So it's not like we can just replace, okay, no mother tongue, let's replace it with multilingualism. It's like a utopia kind of thing. No, not like that, right? Because see, the mother tongue comes in within a hierarchical setup. Even if we looked at it before, on the Tamil case, we saw that part of Tamil mother tongue was also related to uh, politics of like some kind of social justice politics also, right? So hierarchy, you know, as another sociolinguist, which is Mohanty said that, uh, Indian sociolinguist, he said the hierarchy aspect of what constitutes the mother tongue has led to scholars of Indian sociolinguistics to talk about distinctions between mother tongues and other tongues, okay? So mother tongue ideology creates hierarchical pecking order. We have different languages and this pecking order can be understood as what languages in what context becomes preferred, all right? We already had in the last discussion, we were already given some situations with that. Okay, now English, where does that fit in? That's also a big question. So he calls English as a other tongue. All right, Mohanty calls English as a other tongue. There's mother tongue and other tongue. English is a other tongue, yet it's high on the hierarchical pecking order, right? So we don't consider English a mother tongue. Tribal languages, for instance, like, you know, say, uh, Bili or Gondi or these languages, they are considered mother tongues. Their speakers would say that's maybe our mother tongue. But they're low on the pecking order. So he calls them instrumental mother tongues, right? And standardized languages are somewhere in between. So that's Hindi, Tamil, all this Marathi, all these languages that people say they're a mother tongue, but they're standard, Telugu. They're in between. They have partly a prestigious literary space, but within the, I think this was also mentioned, within the educational space, scientific space, commercial space, they're considered inferior. So, of course, in some domains, they're fine. You can use Hindi in your IS exam, or some things you can do that. You know, you can write notices in Hindi in certain places. But then if you want to go more and more in prestigious domains, even in bureaucracy, even in education, everything like this, then your Hindi won't get you that far. So you have other tongue and mother tongues, right? And mother tongues are also bifurcated. So then there's other criticisms that have come to this. So uh, Mohanty and Kupchandani represent one strand of sociolinguistics, right? In which mother tongue ideology 
is challenged. But why are they challenging it? Because they want to preserve some kind of pluralism, right? They talk about hierarchy, but they also, the end goal is to replace it with some non-hierarchical pluralism, right? So they're critical a bit of English. You know, they're saying English is disturbing this pluralism and the other mother tongues are disturbing it, right? Uh, and other scholars have said that, but other scholars have criticized it from a different way, right? Saying that, so they're talking about it as this is a product of engineering. This is kind of a policy product, right? But some scholars like Ahani Babu and Diyu, they've said that this mother tongue ideology is actually part of a hierarchical social system. So caste, you know, hierarchy that comes in. Right, so he, he has a famous article called the Chatur Varna system of languages, right? So this is where mother, uh, mother tongue reflects in some sense, a kind of, uh, you know, ideal uh, structure, social structure that is present in many places, right? So in his argument, it's, in Babu's argument, so these, I'm just introducing you to some arguments here, right? So in Babu's argument, it's what, it's what's happened is there was a process of standardization for most of, Indi of what we call the mother tongues, right? In which Sanskrit was a model. So through Sanskrit, and we talked about this, like even the name mother tongue, everything like this, through Sanskrit, varieties became prestigious as mother tongues. Now there are some exceptions, the Tamil, they sort of, uh, they went through and then they had uh, rejected it. But I think most of the other languages, right? Except for Tamil, except for Urdu, they use Persian. Tamil used some old poetry from a long time ago. <laughs> to standardize their stuff, but equally distant, equally ancient, right? So it's not like Tamil did, it's not going through Sanskrit, but they went through some ancient other thing. <laughs> um, and what happened was that by, by doing this, Babu says they kind of smuggle, smuggle in a Brahminical worldview into the teaching and learning of the vernaculars, okay? So this is his argument. Now, so Sanskrit, the, these, these mother tongues get prestige by their association with Sanskrit. That's why we can say Sanskrit is the origin of all languages with that, you know, I mean, not really. Sanskrit existed in a multilingual space, right? Sanskrit, Prakrit, so many languages were there. Sanskrit itself means perfected language. So how can something, you weren't really supposed to speak it like that, that corrupts it as Prakrit. So how can it, that be the origin of everything? I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> but anyway, that's part of standardization, right? Standardization made that assumption. And this is how mother tongue became standardized. Certain mother tongues in a certain period. And then what do you do with the other mother tongues? They become instrumental or supplementary within the hierarchy, again, using Mohanty's phrase. So um, they become like something that you can use to help people <laughs> develop like, oh, how about we teach the tribals in their mother tongue first, and then we teach them in a standard language, you see, so, so that's there to help people. It's instrumental. It's not like replace the, you know, uh, bureaucracy with a tribal language, right? Or, you know, create that other domain. It's not like, it doesn't go to that step. Teach IIT classes in a tribal language. They're not saying that, right? <laughs> so it's just pure instrumental. There may be arguments to teach IIT classes in Hindi, there is that argument, even though it's not happening, or Gujarati or Tamil, but not nothing like that, right? So it becomes very instrumental in that way. So, 
So Babu says, Babu calls this a Savarna register. Now to what extent it's actually, I mean, we talked about, okay, maybe some, there may be some, you don't maybe want to identify with caste or not. I don't know, but it's, but that's what his idea was. So, so tribal languages are the pecking order. Uh, other groups like Dalits have even less choice in this sense because they don't have mother tongue in that way. So what happens is that Dalits have to identify as speaking a substandard variety of a mother tongue, right? So this is this idea and, they, and then, you know, some in like Maharashtra and stuff, you have Dalit literature in Marathi that is trying to, you know, bring that register up, but still, that's still seen as non-standard Marathi. It's not seen as like Gondi, Bhili, Santali. These are seen as like languages, whereas Dalits don't have that option, right? In that sense, there's no like independent kind of language within the, this system. So from that perspective, Babu is saying that you should promote the other tongue, which is English, all right? Instead of, which is the prestige language that's outside that Chaturvarna system and has not been standardized via Sanskrit. This is for many languages, right? So this is allied with the whole, especially in the, um, you know, the Dalit Bojan thinkers, Kanchanilaya. I mean, Ambedkar made this argument early on, but like it was really, Kanchanilaya has really taken it up a lot and other people. And he's saying that way, okay, promote English. So he has this system where English is science, commerce, education, prestige. Sanskrit is prestige and culture, mother tongues, and then mother tongues. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's some kind of mother tongues which are more prestigious and some mother tongues which are less prestigious. So usually those prestige comes with its proximity to Sanskrit, except for the case of Tamil. But I don't, I would say maybe Tamil doesn't have that much difference in act practice because they they just replace Sanskrit with the, the another classical classical idea right so it's not that everything has to be anchored in some classical thing <laughs> like way past <laughs> right we can't anchor it in the present so if it's not Sanskrit it's something else but it has to be something like far back <laughs> okay so this is the system of language. So Babu is saying that we, instead of promoting mother tongue, we should promote English, right? Whereas other linguists are saying that we should promote plurilingualism, translingualism across. But then Babu is saying that that is not possible within our social setup as of now. First, you need English to empower people. Then they can be on equal terms to have a debate in the first place. This is what the argument is. Okay. So this is what I was saying that Kup Chandani and Mohanty advocate for a plurilingual approach. No language should have a dominant position. Whereas Babu says that education should be in two languages, English and a home language. Then we get into what's a home language, but that's <laughs> but you know, and he said this is because precisely because English is not a mother tongue is why we should learn it. So we should not learn in a mother tongue because mother tongue is if mother tongue is so problematic, then why are we even having a debate about wanting to learn it in the first place, right? <laughs> was his idea. And so right now what's happening is that English, the other tongue is being kept for elite people. So maybe you can, yeah, you can go learn English and do things, but overall, most of the population won't know English anyway, right? So it's being kept for elite people. 
And this is how it's reproducing hierarchical systems. So having this other English is serving a purpose, right? And not having English as a mother tongue is also serving a purpose. So now is us three, <laughs> IIT Gandhinagar study. So this is, uh, so as I said, this hasn't been really linked to language ideology one. I mean, uh, Kup Chandani calls it ideology, but it hasn't really been, the mother tongue hasn't really been linked to language ideology. So in this article, which you also have, uh, like we've tried to look through the meta discourse of students here, those of you in MA and your uh, seniors, <laughs> uh, of language ideology as it relates to the situation of post-colonial society, right? That's, that's the, the, a kind of idea that we've looked at and what the framework is is that we use this framework of post-colonial semiotics so it's easy to kind of say okay yeah these are colonial category get 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 rid of them this that but as we talked about like see we have to take into consideration that mother tongue is still like very important part of how people identify as a category now, when you start asking them what mother tongue is, then it becomes very confusing, right? So there's these colonial categories, not just mother tongue. I mean, so many of our categories are colonial and they, we've, we've constructed our whole life around them, our identity, our institution. So, you know, how they are transforming, how they are, being understood, right, by everyday people. This is where the ethnographic study comes in. So, so far, Indian sociolinguistics hasn't as much engaged in, the, in this kind of ethnographic study, right? It's, it's described linguistic varieties very well. It's talked about power dynamics as a result of policy. You know, it's engaged in the debate, made prescription, this and that. But ethnographic work, now you may debate, okay, what's the value of ethnographic work or something? But as part of what we're trying to say is like, you know, that it, it does have some merit. <laughs> so ethnographic work is not really as much done, right? So that's what we tried to do. We tried to do at least some, it wasn't extensive or anything, but it was like a beginning of a ethnographic work, right? and how it's understood between people about, and from different regions, how it's understood. So now it's not just that language, right? Kup Chandani, everyone has showed that language is highly fluid. Our linguistic practice is highly fluid, but they were arguing that the perception was homogenous, right? We're saying that perception also is fluid. <laughs> ideology, that like having a framework like language ideology shows that perception is also fluid. As you say, perception from Tamil Nadu to uh, even neighboring state Tamil Nadu, Kerala, depending on uh, who you are, right? Telangana, Hindi, I mean, where you come from. We had people coming from Northeast also we interviewed even in our debates here, right? Even how people conceive of the idea of mother tongue is not homogenous actually, it's very different. And that is coming into practice. This ideas affect practice, practice affects ideas. So we can't make this separation. Okay, yeah, mother tongue is this and real reality is like that. And then, you know, that's difficult to do when you're doing ethnography. So for instance, um, okay, like one example we have from the article, right? Now, when we interviewed people, students, say if somebody was of a, 
sometimes religion played a role. So from, in Kerala, if someone was Hindu, they would really say Malayalam, people maybe might say unproblematically, Malayalam is my mother tongue. Now for some of the respondents who questioned that, the Muslim respondents were more likely to question. It. And then you ask why they were coming from a certain region, one, and two, their regions, varieties were, again, not standard. In Kerala, there's that in the religious line, whereas in other places, it may not be that same thing. Right. So region and religion kind of mattered in one area or one state, right? Where in another state or another region, it might be different, right? Of questioning what is this mother tongue. Hindi belt was very complicated. You could write like multiple papers, I guess, just on what's going on in so-called Hindi belt, <laughs> right? Because it, it's a very complex issue. I think, and those of you coming from those places know that, right? Because it's okay, my mother tongue is Hindi, but I speak Haryanvi, I speak Marwari. I, yeah, I speak Hindi sometimes, but mother tongue is still Hindi, this, that, or mother tongue is not Hindi, it's, you know, Avadi, but I don't know it. Okay, so there's many things there, or I speak this, but neighbor speaks that and then speaks that, but then we all say we speak Hindi. Okay, so this is like a very, you know, this is a cross from Rajasthan, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, I mean, everywhere, Bihar. So, so then what is the question here? Question is, it's not about, I mean, it is an important thing to say that, okay, mother tongue is an ideology and practice is there, but you know, that we kind of know already. I think that also you all know, and we know, right? <laughs> as we've been doing this. So how people are linking mother tongue to a linguistic variety. That's a semiotic process. That's where linguistic anthropology comes in, right? How, they're, how they are making those establishing connections between ideology and practice. Through what processes? Is it via caste? Is it via religion? Is it via region? Is it via, people are talking about also strange things like, okay, yeah, like when I go to, a, if I went abroad somewhere, I would say I speak uh, Hindi because I'm Indian. But if I come here and I say Gali's, then I'm Haryanvi or something, you know, something like this or whatever, I'm from Haryana. Okay, they would say all this stuff, right? So your mother tongue changes if you're in like a different place. Okay, so something like that. So, so these are different kind of semiotic process. So we can't, things are not just to one or the other, right? So, and then another finding uh, was about the question of English. So English is also very, has been a very important topic for Indian sociolinguists, right? I mean, it's like writing in English, criticizing English. <laughs> right? So that's a very uh, thing. But this, this, this English question, like we write in it, we think in it, we teach in it, and yet we're not comfortable, <laughs> you know, accepting it, you know. So, uh, and we realize inequality. So, you know, this question is part of the colonial inheritance, right? This this idea that people distinguish English from a mother tongue. This idea that English cannot be a mother tongue. In none of our interviews that English was a mother tongue really. In one interview, and we found some of people like, you know, somebody I think grow, growing up in Delhi, but coming from Hindi, Malayalam, Tamil speaking environment, who spoke English mostly. They said, oh, I don't have a mother tongue. Okay, so they, it's like they would accept English as a mother tongue. They said, I don't have one. You know, I'm, I'm an unmarked person. 
<laughs> so this ideological distinction between English and mother tongue was largely consistent. This is also where mother tongue gets its salience. It doesn't get its salience independently. It gets its salience as an identity via English. Once you start asking what is mother tongue, especially in some complex regions like Hindi belt, then you're without English as a signifier, then you're in some other territory. <laughs> you're in some very complex, complicated territory. But once you have English there, then mother tongue becomes kind of a sim more, more simple way of understanding. I'm not in, uh, we're X, we're this, we're that. So this seems seem to be some of the findings. Of course, if you correct me. <laughs> Is it, huh? And we're going to expand on all this when we talk about how other domains like education, hmm. uh, uh, as Nishan said, almost pull that to transcend them. These things can be very powerful. Yeah. People become very conscious of, of their uh, mother tongues and everything in educational spaces and particularly English educational spaces, because we're doing IIT, right? So a lot of people are coming here. We, we interviewed many MTech students, people who didn't have English education. They come here and all of a sudden just English is like just thrown at them. Then things become confusing, right? And then people start reflecting on like language. We found that too. So this is an institutional issue, you know, way. And we're gonna talk more about that. So I think we're, now we can open, I mean, I have some discussion questions, but we can open the floor for questions or. Also, if you all want to add, since this is a, your <laughs> findings. So. Oh, I don't need to add anything. Do you want to add anything, Chase, on the really. discussion of the paper? Ooh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you covered the. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Uh, I have a clarification or a doubt. So uh, you were talking about uh, instrumental mother tongues versus intermediary, intermediary mother tongues. So could you please uh, talk in detail about this difference? Like, uh, huh. So that distinction came from Mohanty, a linguist. How is this distinction? It was uh, instrumental. So Mohanty he made a distinction in this uh, mother mother and other tongues about instrumental mother tongues and uh, you know sort of prestigious mother tongues. So instrumental, what he called instrumental mother tongues, are that those are the non-prestigious but considered mother tongues. So if you are talking maybe at one point in time Telangana Telugu may have been an instrumental mother tongue if people had even identified it as a mother tongue. It's like, okay, maybe we could teach in the local or uh, uh, you mentioned Lombardi. Yeah, yeah. Some, that would be an instrumental mother tongue in some sense, right? Before there was this consciousness of we should make Lombardi a literary language, this and that. People may have said you should learn it in schools in order to learn uh, Telugu or something, okay? So that would be instrumental mother tongue. And the other mother, mother tongues are mother tongues that have uh, become standardized, have literature, are used in education, right? So that would be maybe Andhra Telugu, right? Would be a standardized mother tongue or something. And, but, and would be used in many domains, but not... Um, no, my, my point in like this confusion, because we, I understand what is standard and what is non-standard, but when you, when Mahanti talked about uh, instrumental, the term instrumental, I'm like a little confused why it is so specifically mentioning like instrumental mother tongues and why uh, they're considering tribal languages as instrumental languages, unlike other non-standard languages, let's so say. That they're not. Uh, he's not promoting that. <laughs> he's just saying that that's what the policy is doing. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not. He's not saying that it should be that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just that's. He's saying that's the policy. Like the policies are making hierarchy between mother tongues. They're not denying that tribal language is a mother tongue, but they're saying that it's not a mother tongue that can be used for more quote unquote sophisticated purpose. Like we can't do bank transaction in it. You can't do fill a form. You can't do a bureaucracy, right? That's that's the policy. He's describing the what he's considering to be a sociolinguistic situation. Uh, we can still say this uh, in uh, instrumental language as non-standard languages, right? Uh, How it is different from that? That's my point. Like so, all non-standard languages may not be considered quote unquote mother tongue. So when you get into that, so for instance, uh, Nagpuri Marathi, that, that may not be considered a, a mother tongue at all. That's, that's just considered quote dialect, you see? Whereas, uh, you know, in Maharashtra, Gondi would be considered a language. That's not considered a dialect, you see? So basically, we can say like uh, tribal languages are uh, uh, instrumental languages and uh, languages which are which we say dialects sometimes are non standard and uh, the standard languages does have social acceptance. Yeah, some tribal languages, some oh. tribal languages which are recognized. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. <laughs> questions no lecture anything so we can go to the discussion if you want about yeah so just a question about policy and practice so what about in your areas do you think there's a difference between or we can even, what time is it? Should we go? Is there a tutorial coming up or? No, I think it's the lunch break. Though. Oh, that's why everybody is quiet. Yeah. Actually, I think the session is over. Oh, session is over. Okay. So why don't we? Yeah, 12.15. So why don't we come back in tutorial? In the tutorial, uh, maybe either you can look at some policies or I have uploaded the national education policy. So we can look at that and discuss it. Right. In terms of policy and practice, I've uploaded the short version <laughs> and there's the section on multilingualism is very clear. So we can re read that over and then we can talk about it with relation to policy and practice. Okay. Did you upload it in the uh, course drive? Huh? Did you upload it in the course drive? Yeah. It in the the Gyan readings is that shared with everyone? Can you look? All right, I'll end the meeting.